introduced to is the dry eye workshop uh, results that came out, which started off from the Tear and Ocular Service Society, develop, or going into and delving into um, how dry eye disease evolves, what's the epidemiology, and looking at what treatments have worked. So it's really, for us, trying to get evidence-based ways of evaluating and managing. I think the most important thing of Jews is there's been an evolution from 1994 when they started work on dry eye disease through to the first Jews in 2007 and last year we had Jews too. And the main difference is being that we used to treat dry eye disease, which it then was described in 1994, as an algorithm you went through to manage the patient, as opposed to a patient with a disease that needs to be managed. So it's very much more patient focused. So if you look at the um, management protocol selected by or suggested by Jews too, there are four steps. Step one is a, a base entry level that everyone can do, which is talking about um, the environment, the problems, looking at lubrication, whatever. When you go into second level, then you're looking at uh, preservative free drops and moving up to punctual plugs and things like that. So that's a higher situation. And looking at drugs that are taking, systemic drugs, topical drugs they're using if they've got glaucoma or other conditions, and then uh, moving on and saying, right, okay, the next level is really independent prescribing because you're potentially looking at steroids or um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops. After that, you're into surgical, which is beyond us. So there's three levels at which we can work as an optometrist. Tear film stability. We've looked at tear breakup time. We talk about it. It's very difficult to measure, but it's crucial. It gives an indication how well it's coping with the environment and the buzzword is hyperosmolarity. And it's something where we've never looked at this, but it's actually, as the tears dry out, the concentration increases, often you find they become more salty, which is why they can actually complain about a stinging. And it's that hyperosmolarity that then starts to go on and creates a problem, which sucks the moisture out of the tissue, shutting down the tear ducts, and therefore, you find it starts to exacerbate the problem. So you've got this virtuous circle. So what you're trying to do is go into that circle at various parts of the cycle and try and disrupt it and get it going the other way. So you then find that you're getting that oily layer better, you're getting a better tear consistency, and hopefully then there's a resilience. Really what we're trying to do is get the eye to work properly. Now we, we get it to produce the correct tears. Having said that, if you can't, we supplement it, but really the supplement should be a minimum. It's then the fact that when you put the, the tears in, because of the blinking, they're going to get washed away. You want it thick enough to give the support to stop the lid rubbing, but then grease is over and the patient can't see you, so they want it thin enough so it doesn't blur vision, but it won't be quite effective. And that's where you sort of tailor time of day as to what you supply and also how much has got to be used. Don't expect the results instantly. It can take quite a while. And because it's a chronic condition, it will need ongoing management. But hopefully you can reduce the management as you get it working better. The less of a burden and the easier it's to follow is important and it's important you give written instructions because it's amazing how often how they forget how often do the hot compress, how to clean the lids and also how often uses artificial tears if required. If the management is greater than the problem they won't perform it and as I mentioned in, in the talk you've got to think of it as if you're the patient. Would you follow that regime? And it's amazing you talk to practitioners and they will actually turn around and say, um, yes, okay, do this, but if they were asked to do it themselves, they wouldn't. It is a growing problem. So part of it is self-induced. I mean, what I find criminal now is you go out for a meal and you'll see young children with an iPad or tablet put in front of them to keep them quiet. There's no communication. You look at how many people use phones. And really, when you start to concentrate, you reduce the blink rate, that starts to the drying out. Then it's really, can the tears support the lifestyle and environment you're in? If it can't, then you're down the dry eyes.